Welcome to the Big Mike Fun Podcast, where you learn about advanced wealth building strategies from real estate investing to creating massive ROI and secure retirement profits. So pour yourself a cup of coffee, grab a notepad, and lean in. Because Big Mike has got the mic, starting now. Welcome to the Big Mike Fun Podcast. I'm the Big Mike. Mike Zlatnik, and today it is my pleasure and a privilege to welcome back my really good friend, Dr. David Phelps. Hey, David. Mike, it is always a pleasure to see you. Thanks for having me on today. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. You always share great wisdoms. And uh, let's talk a little bit about what's happening out there. We are sort of doing this recording in the middle of 2024 right before the Independence Day. Um, so what's your view of the world? Where are we in the real estate cycle and uh, economy in general? Yeah, well, the world could, could take us about two hours to cover, so I'm not going to cover the world. But <laughs> there's a lot going on in the world for sure, Mike, and, and we both know that. Uh, taking it more specifically to uh, what we what we love and what we you know are involved in uh, over many decades is you know the alternative space, and i.e., uh, real estate. Um, it's it's what I've been involved in since 1980. So gosh, I'm dating myself, but uh, going back over four decades when I started as a very young investor, but understanding the value of investing in hard assets, tangible assets, uh, real estate, business, something that you know you can you see, touch, and feel. Uh, I'm not a- averse to people investing in uh, other financial products, stock market bonds. There's a place for all that in one's portfolio. But I found over the years, Mike, that the most stable place that I had more control, and I think this is the key, uh, more control over my investment capital was in in real estate assets, whether it was early on in my years when I was really hands-on and you know buying properties or making uh, direct lending uh, to people that I kind of vetted out over the years. Uh, I learned a lot and I really got through a lot of the ups and downs of the cycles that we've gone through you know, since that time in my life, 1980. Well, right now we're in a cycle. Uh, we're in a long protracted cycle, which I believe has already turned the corner and we are heading on the downslope. Uh, we talk often, Mike, as, as you display very accurately that, um, that that we always go through these cycles. There's the up cycle, uh, there's the peak, and then there's the down cycle. Uh, various periods of time, they're all a little bit different, but typically we see these these up cycles can you know go six, eight, nine, ten, ten years or so. The down cycles are usually um, more abbreviated. Uh, they can be you know sharp and hard, uh, or they can be a little bit more prot- protracted over a period of time. You never know what you've got until you look back in hindsight. But the fact is, Mike, we're always in a period of time in the cycle. And so I'd say right now we're on the down cycle. We're seeing it more in the tangible hard asset, you know, real estate space, and even more so specifically in the commercial space. And we can talk about commercial versus housing if you want to go there and why the difference. Uh, but we're seeing it more there uh, initially for reasons that you and I both know. What we haven't seen and what I think creates a lot of complacency for people today uh, who also look at their their 401ks, their IRAs, their tax brokerage accounts is the overall stock market, the S&P, the Dow, uh, the NASDAQ, uh, particularly this last year, uh, has, has done quite well. Uh, but when you peel back the layers, uh, you take a look and you say, well, there's been a very, very small cadre, primarily the, the tech st- stocks um, that have driven the market. And I would say to a lot of people there, well, that's that's an anomaly. You know, be careful. Just like I would tell people, you know, don't get on the train with you know a particular um, real estate um, investment, if you feel like you're still chasing the yield, chasing something that's been going on, it's fine to kind of go for that when we're in a growth cycle. But when we're turning the corner, it's time to take a little bit of a different look. Doesn't mean you you divest. Doesn't mean you pull back and go. Well, I'm not going to put any money out there. It's being prudent and discerning about where's the best place to go. So that's my my quick uh, outlay. You take it where you want to go. Thank you, David. Uh, that's a great wisdom. And I'll reflect on this. So cycle in commercial real estate uh, peaked in the middle of 2022. Now looking in the rear view mirror, it's pretty obvious that it was a peak of the cycle. And if you go back and correlate that to what was happening with interest rates, interest rates hike just started. Yep. And uh, But the Fed moved fast and furious. And that's the reason that they forced real estate cycle to go from the peak into an immediate uh, correction and then into recession rather, rather fast. So we certainly find ourselves looking in the back view your mirror uh, as a response to the rapid changes in the interest rate environment, which is uh, very, very 
the real commercial real estate is, is very sensitive to the interest rate. And then the stock market, the commentary you have, I, I call it everything rally. And I'm, I'm very concerned about rally, everything rally. Although I, I can't predict the future. You could have things continue to keep uh, climbing. Of course, it's an election year, who knows? But I, I remember the 2000 uh, crash of the high-flying uh, stock, stocks, how the rally was just getting more and more accelerated. And these high-tech companies' valuations were going through the roof. So I don't know anything uh, beyond that. I'm not an expert in underwriting these, these assets. Of course, we have the AI technology and some other changes that are propelling the rally. But at the same time, it feels like everything rally. And then everything rally is very, very dangerous. The Bitcoin, the crypto, the, the stock market, and a few other asset classes just uh, appear to be, uh, have done really, really well. And the other really interesting thing, which is a very important portfolio uh, diversification strategy is things to move things around. Uh, if something is overpriced, if you have a lot of success in the stock market, you've done really well in crypto, perhaps there's a consideration to actually go into alternatives, especially commercial real estate now, because it's trading at a significant discount. There's a value in commercial real estate where other asset classes appear to be significantly, I don't want to call it overpriced. I would say fully priced, possibly overpriced, only the future will show. So what should folks do on a forward basis? Those folks who are uh, just mindful that they need to diversify their portfolio, that meaning not saying move out every dollar from the stock market into alternatives, mm -hmm. you have to obviously diversify prudently, but at least take some uh, dollars of what has appreciated tremendously and consider alternatives as a way to reduce the risk and exposure to something that's already overvalued or overweighted in the individual portfolio. So what do you think about the forward uh, outlook for where the opportunities might look in the commercial real estate with a full disclaimer, your guess and my guess, right. and the crystal ball guesses are just as good as, as, your, as your view of the crystal ball future. Yeah, well, as, as we both know, there are different sectors in the commercial real estate space, different asset classes. So we can start there and break those down. And, and you know, you actually, in presentations I've seen you do recently, you've got a really good uh, graph of that and looking at some of the different sectors and where we see them as terms of where where the decline has been and where we might want to you know, enter back in on the uptick, meaning they're discounted in, in values today to the extent where it makes sense. You can never do what we call catch a falling knife because it's impossible to, to time anything. But but there's metrics that we both use that I know use uh, all the time in determining, you know, is, is there is there a... a a point of st stabilization um, when you buy an asset at a discount, well, based on the current market, based on what that asset class is, based on the uh, demographic of the tenant, the use, uh, what does that look like in the economy today? And that's those are some of the parameters you look at. So whatever that asset class is, it could be multifamily, it could be self-storage, it could be mobile home parks, it could be retail. You have to look at each one of those individually. You look at them by, by class, you look at them by uh, demography uh, and, and geography, right? So we look at all of these things and there are a lot of variables and you have to weigh those, uh, I think, and look and say, well, does does this particular opportunity, does it make sense for my allocations in the market today? So that's that's where I would start. Um, to your point also, whenever you've had a up, up run and you've made uh, a, a great capital gain profit in some asset class, I think it is wise to take some what we call take chips off the table because everything comes back to a more of a, a, a norm. We call it a mean reversion, reversion to the mean. When anything has gone up and extrapolated over time, and you mentioned, you know, all the tech stocks, you know, the MAG-7, which is down to about the MAG-3, magnificent I'm speaking of, uh, you, can, you can play the same thing with crypto. It's very volatile, but when it's at a high, maybe you take some chips off the table and say, great, I want to harvest some of that because Probably at some point, we're going to have a reversion to the mean, uh, and it's going to come back down to some extent, level back out. Maybe it drops below the mean. Usually what happens, it drops below the mean, then comes back up again. So can I be discerning? Don't take everything out. No. You decide, well, I'll take some out. What proportion? That depends upon your risk allocate, your risk tolerance, your allocations, where you are in your it, when your career path, your active income, are you still still have a lot of time for growth in uh, years ahead, or are you nearing the end of your active income cycle? So different strokes for different folks, but that's where I start to look in terms of of reallocating capital in a dynamic marketplace. Yeah, I appreciate that, and that's a great wisdom. It, it's don't make 
drastic moves, just the moves that adjust your portfolio gradually and obviously change with the uh, uh, position where you are in, in your life journey. And then, and, and like you said, all real estate is local. So it's very important to uh, think about what portions of the United States, what strategies are most applicable to you. But let's go back for a second, just, just, just to sort of uh, acknowledge what some of the challenges of the past. And what should folks do or how should they think about their portfolios if they've written checks in the last couple of years in commercial real estate? It is a difficult conversation, but it's an important conversation. And uh, one of the very important elements of diversification, I think both you and I have talked about this over time, is diversification in time. Most people forget that. They just diversify. But when you have a tidal wave that hits you, like interest rates spike, it hit a lot of things at the, all at the same time. So people got hit by this tidal wave, and they're feeling a little bit of a, of a pain. So what? how should they be thinking? And one kind of a thought that comes to mind, and I'd like you to comment on that, is that don't let fear and emotion mm -hmm. drive logical decisions. Because emotional decisions are difficult and fearful decisions can often lead to the wrong conclusions. So um, what do you think? Yeah, great context. You know, one thing that I hear often, and I think it's a it's 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 a wise principle, but again, you have to take it in context. Warren Buffett's rule number one, never lose principle. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one, right? <laughs> uh, well, that's that's bad about a lot. But even Warren Buffett, with all of his wisdom, and he has plenty. He has had losses, you know, in his building his his platform. He had losses along the way. Um, now he's obviously over his years. He's very astute and he's uh, has more discernment as as we all gain in the experience of learning how to best allocate our capital. You know, Mike, I'm a big fan of of being more in charge of everything I do. I'm a, kind of a control freak, and that comes with um, with its with the responsibilities and the downturn of yeah. I got to keep my fingers on the pulse of a lot of stuff. That's just who I am. I'm not one who likes to abdicate and just, well, here, you know, you take my money and, and here's the 401k. And I'm not demeaning anybody who helps people with that financial advisor. Otherwise, I just personally like to be more involved. So if I'm going to do that, I have to become more discerning and do more study in terms of the market. And I have to expect in my own, own right, if I'm going to have growth of my investments, which we, we all want growth, I'm going to have to take some level of risk, but I'm going to mitigate that risk. So back to your point, diversification, uh, allocations. Uh, we talk about the risk curve. And so let me give a kind of a visual dynamic of what a risk curve is. Just think about um, think about being on an island um, and you are you hear that there's reports of a tsunami building way out at sea. You know, the reports come, there's been a tremor and there's prediction, you know, within four hours or so, uh, some level of tsunami is coming in. Everybody's down on the beach in the seafront and they're enjoying it. It's like, well, what do you do, right? I mean, the wise people start to do what? They seek higher ground. Well, how high? Well, I don't know. No one knows. I mean, do you, do you go to the highest points you can go or do you go inland as far as you go? I don't know. Nobody knows, but you have to decide on your own how much risk you're willing to take uh, in, in that particular case. So when I talk, when I see the markets changing, I go, well, where do I go to higher ground? Uh, with some of my capital. Now, some ca I'm not going to move all my capital. I'm going to leave some of it in some of the uh, growth aspects. And maybe we don't have as much growth now. That's okay. Uh, but maybe higher ground for me is being more on the, uh, what I call the private credit side. Private credit for people who don't understand. It's, it's like being the bank. It's lending money to commercial operators rather than be on the equity side. You know, equity equity is where it's sexy. Uh, we all want to be part of equity because equity has all the benefits of leverage uh, and arbitrage and tax benefits and you just name it. I mean, we all want to be part of equity plays and it's wonderful when the market's going up, play ball. Where in the turn of the market, I'd rather go to higher ground by moving some of my allocations more to the private credit, the lending side, the be the bank side, because I can, I can, reduce my risk factor of not being all in on an asset. If I'm in an equity position somewhere, I'm going to be in equity. I'm going to be, you know, somewhere in a tranche of all the way to the, to the value that of that equity. And my hope is that we're still in a move up so that equity will grow. Well, what if we're not? What if I'm seeing the the shades of we're, we're, we're seeing some downturn as we are now? Well, why do I want to be there? I'd like to move to a different tranche uh, in the capital stack, uh, which is, you know, I don't want to get too, too, uh, too deep here, but the capital stack being basically equities on the top and the debt side or private credit side on the bottom, if I can move from the height of the equity 
down to some tranche of debt, well, I've just reduced my risk. And so that's a place I think today uh, I'm, well, I am, you know, investing more in that particular arena. Yeah, I appreciate that. And by the way, these, um, the strategy you just mentioned, the private credit, is the most prevalent strategy during, during a recessionary uh, part of the market cycle. So we talked about this. We are in the commercial real estate in a recession, although overall economy may not be in the recession yet, but the commercial real estate, again, having responded um, uh, to the uh, rapidly increased interest rates finds itself in the commercial real estate. So for sure, I concur with you, a higher ground today is in the private credit, either in the first lien loans, typically called hard money loans, they could be on a fix and flip projects or other uh, projects, or it could be secondary uh, loans or mezzanine debt. As long as they're underwritten conservatively, as long as there's enough safety margin behind it, there's enough equity on the as-is basis, with the competent operators, I certainly concur that that strategy is a higher ground in this environment and it makes a lot of sense. So what's a forward outlook? How do you, um, so investing in private credit, lending funds, lending, mezzanine uh, lending funds, it, it's, it's exactly what we think, feel is the best opportunity for the rest of the year into next year. But what else? How do you know you got a, you got a great deal? Should folks consider uh, buying a deep, uh, participating in a deep, uh, buy today, and, and how would you consider doing a deep buy? Maybe it's too early for deep buys. Maybe you got to see, take the time and wait to see where things will shake out. I'm just curious because uh, we are beginning to see uh, what I call them first discussions on the deep buys, potentially deep buys, and it, it feels like there are the right type of opportunities ahead. Um, is this the right time to come in, or maybe it's time to be a little more patient? What do you think? I'm going to look at each deal individually, Mike, as, as you do, and I'm going to say, well, deep buy, right. Well, is that just is that based on discount to what that particular asset class would have brought um, six months ago, 12 months ago, 18 months ago when interest rates were, were lower? Uh, wh what are we talking? You know, so I say, what are we talking about? Uh, so so there's some history involved. But more, more important, I think, is I've got to look at what that asset, whatever it is, will produce on a current stabilized basis. So you might buy an asset today that essentially is stabilized with you know a certain occupancy of tenant uh, usage or tenants paying. Uh, and so so what's the buy there? Well, be, maybe you have an operator that had to give that asset up at a discount because they have other operations that are going south. This one's nothing's wrong with this one, but it's a it's a good asset that they can at least extract some some capital, but they're offering it today at what we know is a reduced rate. Uh, well, so I'm going to say, well, how much? How much additional margin, mainly being free cash flow? What's the free cash flow? Now, if we're going to go in and the operator is going to buy it with with new debt uh, today, well, now I've got to put that in place. So you've got your NOI. So mainly, what's your cash flow margin? Well, how significant is that on the scale? You know, two years ago, well, I'd go in on something that was that was was a little tighter, right? Today, I want more margin on that because. We don't know where the market dynamics and the economy is going to go. I'm guessing, this is my guess, that we're at the beginning stages of an economy that is very fraught with a lot of, uh, of potential downside. I'm talking about consumption, consumers that are really strapped. And consumers are what drive 70% of our GDP, our economy. Uh, if they can afford to do the things that that drive consumption, and that includes whether they, they live in houses, rent houses, live in apartments, rent houses, put money in self storage, uh, whatever they do, uh, that drives the economy. If consumers have to pull back to any significant degree, well, that's going to reduce margins on everything: businesses, real estate, you name it, hospitality across the board. It's going to reduce margins. So I need more margin today. Now, exactly what that is. That becomes, you know, a very subjective um, place, but that's where I pe have people start to look and understand through people like you. What What are you looking at, Mike? How are you doing these things? Because I want to hear through you because you look at these all the time. So I'm not going to rely just on myself. I'm going to say, well, who else does this on a regular basis? Who I who can I compare notes with and say, well, what do you think? I want some wisdom around me uh, before I make some specific allocations myself. Yeah, that's a great, uh, great wisdom. And I have to say that these words, margin of safety, they go back to the Benjamin Graham, Warren Buffett, and all value investors. Uh, when they are looking to write a check, they're looking for the margin of safety. 
and, and these are uh, the words of the wise. What is a margin of safety? It varies, of course, but um, like you said, how deep is the current cash flow and as is basis, borrowing at the current high interest rates with the current typically low leverage and um, uh, also looking at other risks. So if you, if you can analyze uh, the deal and see that its margin of safety is high and downside protection is high, and then also can see what the potential upside, if there is a little bit of relief and the interest rates calm down, uh, it becomes what, what uh, I've heard this, this term. I love the term. It's a, it's a fancy term, but it's, it's a, it, it, this term is very, very powerful. We call them asymmetric return. Mm-hmm. So asymmetric return can be very, very powerful. That's what, what Warren Buffett did when they gave $5 billion to Goldman Sachs in the middle of 2008 wow. crisis, and they put it in preferred equity, and they had all kinds of provisions protecting them, and they knew that it was very, very difficult for them to lose money, although there's a, you know, theoretically there's risk in everything. Even the deals with the asymmetric great upside and limited downside still have a risk. So that thinking is incredibly powerful because that's the right type of thinking. So I, I certainly really respect and appreciate your, 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 your comments and the thought for looking for the margin of safety. So um, what else should folks do today? Uh, of course, they, they get paid to sit in their hands, get uh, high interest rates of taking no action. Are there other things besides kind of capital deployment exercises? Yeah. What else can they do about their lifestyle, about mm. their legacy, about their family? Um, basically prepare for like, what you're mentioning, a recession. A recession could be an economic recession. Something else could happen, some kind of uh, bad event. So I'm just curious how other thoughts you 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 are you are you've done a lot of great wisdom and teachings on the legacy and maybe it's an opportunity for folks to look at some of those things that are just outside of monetary uh, plans. Yeah, from a, a legacy standpoint, which I think here we're talking about what I would call you know generational wealth and generational wealth is not just the wealth, the assets, the money that can be a part of it. But I think we all care about our up and coming generations, you know, our kids, our grandkids, our nieces, our nephews, anybody who within a family unit, you, you, we care about them. We we all, we typically say, well, I want my kids, my grandkids to to have a better life than than I did. Um, and that's not saying a lot. I mean, that's that's not saying a lot because I really had a good, blessed life. So I don't need them to have a better life, but I want them to have a good life, right? Let's put it that way. Uh, but I don't want it to be built on a false sense of security uh, because. I've been able to provide well for my family and I, and I love that fact and everybody wants to do that. So when, when people haven't really seen tough times in their own life, because they've been the benefactor of, you know, maybe a great economy, a, you know, a good family, uh, then what, where are their lessons? Because we all have to learn lessons. Uh, the lessons are where we, we gain the most in life. It's not just the wins, the things that go well, that's wonderful. Uh, but where do we learn? We will learn from mistakes, failures, setbacks, whatever you want to call them. And if our kids haven't had those or we haven't shared uh, our lessons with them in, at the right time, time, the appropriate age, then we've really left them uh, at risk. Uh, because, again, it's not just saying, well, here, I'll, I'll I'll be able to send you to school so you don't have any debt. I'll start your first business. I'll, I'll leave a trust fund for you. I mean, that's all within the cards, but I think that's a big mistake. Um, so I think teaching our young people and giving them uh, a better knowledge of the, the things we talked about today, you know, market cycles and uh, what, what what may be coming in the future. So they have some ability to learn that they may have to pivot and be resourceful. Uh, from a practical standpoint, Mike, I think, again, this can be, again, lessons to kids, but our, in our own families, that we should have our own house in order financially. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means uh, fixed rate debt uh or re- reducing debt uh you know credit cards that have ballooned up uh maybe just because of uh, needs or emergencies got it but you know reduce those in fact reduce those kind of that kind of debt before you even invest more money in something just knock off that debt get things fixed in place create more margin in your own family budget right so maybe that means having maybe right now just being more disciplined 
uh, and not being scarcity minded, but just saying, let's just create a little bit of discipline. Do we need to spend the same amount of money every week on the stuff that we've been so uh, open and lax to do this last few years? We came out of COVID. Everybody want to get back to enjoying life. And so, yeah, I get it. But we have to have some constraints again at some point. Uh, so just building out a plan and having those conversations within a family is really important because you can't just drive it yourself. Uh, you may be a very prudent person, head of household and thinking, boy, I, you know, I'm, but if your family doesn't understand the what, the why, um, they may look at you as like some kind of ogre and you don't want to be that person. So what do we keep doing? Well, we keep going to Disneyland every year, or whatever it is, right? It's like, maybe we can find some value in experiences and time with family that don't really require a lot of expenditures that we got used to in recent years. Yeah, that's a lot of great uh, wisdom and great nuggets. I appreciate that. And I, I've had discussions with some of my kids and, and trying to uh, <laughs> have this discussion. Do you really need this? Do you really need? And and are you are you working to make the money to to afford that? And uh, these are very simple uh, but important conversations to make sure uh, kids uh, learn to be self sufficient. Um, and the other thing I, I have to say is this is a new generation, of course. A lot of kids have been used to um, a lot of things being good for them, uh, either from the government giving them or the family, and uh, they don't learn enough lessons. I, I, I'm discovering this every day, and I, I'm trying to be a better parent. Maybe I do too much for the kids, and then I realize, wait a minute, I need to make sure that the kids are learning the right, the right lesson. So. I'd say I, I, I'm grateful for your wisdom. It reminds me that I have to really do a better job as a parent to let kids, uh, my kids learn, and we all need to do that. So um, I, I like this expression. This episode, like many other things, just comes to an end. So what are the parting thoughts? Any really good books? Any good suggestions? Uh, anything recent comes, comes to mind? So folks can... Um, I'll, I'll tell you this. This is the book I'm... I'm listening to right now on Audible. Uh, and I wasn't aware of this book. When I saw it, when I heard it, I, I start listening and I'm on the third uh, iteration. And we just we just talked about this. And the book is very simple. It's John Maxwell. Sometimes you win and sometimes you learn. And that's life. And this is very relevant. And, and, and as I'm re-listening to the book, so many very basic and great nuggets are in the book. So I certainly recommend that, but I would love to ask you, do you have anything fresh, new, or something you're reading that kind of comes to mind that you'd like to share with uh, with the audience? I think a book that's been out for a few years, but it's Jocko Willink, Extreme Ownership. And then he wrote a sequel to that, which is The Dichotomy of Leadership. And those are good books because I think uh, we all have to take some personal responsibility in our lives. And if you can particularly teach that that concept, that principle to young people, our young people, uh, to take ownership. It doesn't mean you um, you annihilate yourself when you go through life and you have some lessons to your point with John Maxwell's book, sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. Learning is part of life, uh, but also you know, owning your decisions uh, and what you do and accepting those and taking responsibility. So I think those, that's, that, those are two good books that uh, could be kind of classics on the bookshelf that people could uh, utilize, uh, re review from time to time, and pass on to uh, the kids or other people that they care about. Yeah, that's awesome. I read that book, and extreme ownership is a very, very powerful concept. It's just too easy. <laughs> I'm going back to the years of corporate world, and I remember a lot of people, people don't want to own things. They just want to get paid, and they just want to kind of go through the job day in and day out. Extreme ownership is an, a very, very important uh, character uh, uh, strength and it, it's also a mental commitment to own things and to own your decisions and to um, act as a leader and being a leader is hard so I, I appreciate that book David thank you so much so much for your wisdom thank you for sharing as always it's, it, it's an awesome episode and I look forward to a continuous friendship and the wisdoms and every time kind of we connect we chat uh, I personally learn a lot from you so I'm, I'm grateful. And uh, I also wanted to thank you for your continuous leadership because uh, you provide great leadership during the times of adversity, uh, times of challenge, and it's not easy to do. So thank you. Mike, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Big Mike Fun Podcast. To receive your copy of Mike's How to Choose a Smart Real Estate Fun Book, head to BigMikeFun.com or visit Amazon and type Mike's slot name. 
Keep listening and keep investing Big Mike style. See you on the next episode.